Hello, everyone. My name is Judith Halim, but maybe we can uh, pray before we start. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus, for such a time like this that we can come before you to honor you. We want to lift your name on high so that you can draw all men unto yourself alone. And we want to surrender the rest of the sharing into your loving hand. May your Holy Spirit come and fill your people, touch your people, and also bring healing to your people. And in Jesus' name, all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Okay, I came from Bermuda, North Sumatra, uh, where Lake Toba is. Any one of you been to Lake Toba, Medan? Okay, yeah. I, I, I grew up in a very poor family. My father was a gambler, womanizer, and often beaten up my mother. At the age of 18 months, my father abandoned me and left us, and uh, nowhere about that we can find him. So I grew up uh, very bitter, very uh, lack of love. There is no hope because uh, we are living in uh, poverty. At the age of uh, 20, the one, I met a Singaporean man who do business in Indonesia. And at the moment when he looked at me, he said, I fall in love with you and I want to marry you. I was looking for a hope at that point of time. I was looking for love. I was looking for a redeemer, someone that can redeem me out of my situation and out of my poverty. And there I got this offer and he said, that I will bring you to Singapore. Surely your life will be restored. Everything will be good for you. Economy, uh, future, everything will be good. So at that point of time, I was like this 21 years old, uh, you know, a village girl, never been on an aeroplane before never go to oversee so uh guess what i say come on you also very fast yeah so i said yes and i uh you know i got married uh, a short after that uh, six months after i got married i got pregnant and we were living in jakarta and he said that uh, you know when the baby is uh, when the pregnancy is reached eight months old you have to go to singapore give birth in singapore so that our baby can become singaporean 21 years old, eight month pregnancy, I packed my bag and I came to Singapore. And little did I know that it was my one-way ticket. You know the song, One-Way Ticket? Okay, those who are not my generation doesn't know. <laughs> one-way ticket to the moon, you go and you don't get to come back. Okay, I came to Singapore, gave birth to my uh, baby girl uh, in the hospital. And the second day after my baby was delivered, the doctor said that uh, they discover a few uh, complications. And uh, on the fifth day, they concluded, your baby has got three complications. The first one was she had three holes in her heart. The second one, the right ventricle is very thick, preventing the blood and the uh, uh, energy to circulate, to go to the upper part of the body. And because of that, she has brain damage. And the third thing is uh, she is a Down syndrome. I couldn't take it. I was only like 21 years old, uh, uh, coming to 22 at that point of time. And uh, I was uh, saying this, if there is God, I want to know why life is so unfair for me. As a child, what I want is a complete family, means there's father, there's mother, and I was deprived of, deprived of it. And as a mother, what we want is only a healthy child, right? And yet, I was deprived of it. The doctor said that your baby cannot live past three months, and therefore, uh, she cannot be discharged, and I cannot go back to Indonesia. I continue to stay in Singapore. Doctor said that your baby cannot live past three months. Surely, she will die. But bad thing does not stop there. Her father, when she was one month old, her father came to the hospital and looked at the both of us. And when he looked at us, this is what he said to me. He said, I think we are not meant for each other. I said, what do you mean that we are not meant for each other? We got married and then we got a child and the child is sick and the doctor said that she, she, she will not live past three months. And this is what he said. 
I just don't love you anymore. To me, it was like, what is love, actually? He did not say much. He left uh, us the, the next day, and uh, I was alone in Singapore, in a foreign country, in a foreign land that I know not of the language, I know not of the people. I have no money, I have no relatives, I have no friend, and what I have is only a sick child. 26 years ago, I don't speak English. All I speak is Bahasa Indonesia and Hokkien. So, quietly, I left my baby in the hospital. Quietly, I booked a ticket to go back to Indonesia, Jakarta, where our house is, to just check out what's going on. Quietly, I stepped into my house. Quietly, I stepped into my bedroom, and I saw there's another woman sleeping on my bed, using my helper, using my driver, and this heart breaks. Immediately, I stopped a cab, and I went back to uh, uh, Sukarno Hatta Airport to rebook my air ticket because my daughter was still in the hospital. I sat on the bench of the airport while waiting for my next flight, and I cried, and I cried, and I cried. And I said this, if there is God, you need to come and meet me halfway because even to take the next breath is painful right here. The pain of betrayal, the pain of being dumped over and over again as if you are a piece of trash. First is your father abandoned you and now your husband abandoned you. I was crying at that bench when I was crying, I saw a woman passing me by. She was wearing a cross like what I'm wearing today. And my eyes captured that cross. And I remember when I was little, my kindergarten teacher ever said this to me. For whoever that call upon the name of Jesus will be saved. So I call upon the name of Jesus. I say, Jesus, if you are a true living God, come and help me. Because I don't think I can make it another day. I came back to Singapore. All hope is gone. All my dream crashed. I checked my daughter out from the hospital because there's no more money. And I only have one solution. And the solution is, I want to carry my daughter, and I wanted to jump down. I was living in a this 14th floor uh, flat. I planned to jump down 14th floor. Jumping down 14th floor, die or not? Will die, right? Sure, yeah. But Jesus plans, and Jesus' way is higher than my ways and my plan. Amen. I wrote a letter to my mother to say that I'm sorry I cannot send money back anymore. Life is just too painful for me. I'm going to end it. I plan that I want to go out to Orchard Road for the very last time so that the next day I just want to carry my daughter and I want to jump down from 14th floor. Around, uh, that was around 12 o'clock where I wrote a letter. Around 2 o'clock, I received a phone call from insurance agent. Any insurance agent here? What about uh, at the roof? Uh, what about at the Zoom? <laughs> okay. And uh, YouTube, uh, I really thank God for insurance agent. Insurance agent called me and he said that I hear from so and so that uh, you know you just have a baby and if you buy insurance policy from me right now, the price is worth it. Okay. So I spoke with, with, with him in a, in, a, in a Hokkien and I said that no, I'm not going to buy. Okay. I don't have money to buy and I want to put down the phone. And before I put down the phone, from the other side, he said, hold it. Mm, tonight, my church got a special speaker. Can I invite you to come to my church? I was thinking this surely is a madman, right? I mean, want to sell me insurance, I say no. Then uh, he wants to, to invite me to church, right? So, uh, on the other hand, I, re I wanted to go to Orchard Road for the last time. And uh, I'm not familiar with Singapore, and it's very troublesome to bring baby, to bring diapers and all that. So I say that if you can bring me to Orchard Road, I will go with you to, uh, you know, uh, if you can bring me to Orchard Road, I'll, I'll go with you to a church. She must be thinking that this is a mad woman that I'm talking to, you know. Yeah, so, uh, but guess what he said? He said that my church is right 
off Orchard Road. I will come and get you. And then he and his wife uh, came and get me and put me in uh, this uh, 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 church just right off uh, Orchard Road. It was a big church. And you know what? It's English service. You remember? I don't, I, I don't understand English, right? I don't speak English. It's my first time in my entire life that I have ever stepped into a place that is called church. And it's English service. Yeah? So uh, I don't really know what they are doing. They were like a singing, like what we did uh, earlier. I couldn't understand a single thing. And then they were like, the pastor was like preaching. I also did not understand a single thing. And this couple that brought me to church, they were so busy, okay, so they put me right at the back. The third row from the back, and he said, I'll come and get you at the end of the service. And then they, 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 they uh, disappeared, yeah. So left me and my baby. I was like, you know, when is this going to end? It is very painful right here. At the end of the service, the pastor invited people to come forward to get prayer. Obviously, I didn't even know what they are doing. But from the stage, he said, that woman, that woman with the baby, I want you to come forward. I didn't even know that he's calling me, but suddenly, ushers came from the left and from the right. You know, ushers is the most hardworking per, uh, person in, in, in the church. Okay, ushers came from the left and the right and pushed me. I said, go, 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 go. He's calling you, you know. Yeah, I came up on the stage and, he, and, and this pastor asked me, do you want to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? They would translate to me in Hokkien and I said, who is this Jesus? I do not know who is this Jesus. But suddenly, I saw the whole auditorium was red in color. Reda red. And suddenly, I sense a peace that transcends beyond understanding. The peace that 22 years living, eating, walking on earth, I never knew this kind of peace exists. And I said to him, I don't know who is this Jesus, but if Jesus that you're talking about is equivalent to this peace that I am experiencing, I must have it. I cannot live without it. I received Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior at that point of time. And uh, I cried and cried and cried and cried. I cried and I've forgotten I want to go to Orchard Road. Huh? Suddenly this couple come. Okay, I said, come and bring me home. They brought me home. That was the very first night that I'm able to sleep very soundly. I had depression, major depression. I can don't sleep for five days. I can don't eat for five days. But that night, I'm able to sleep. And the next day, as I got up, I was searching. I was looking. Where is that pain? Where is the excruciating pain right here in my heart that caused me to even cannot breathe? It is gone. Just like that. It is gone. I pick up a letter that I wrote to my mother to say that I wanted to kill myself. And I look at it. And this time round, I said to myself, I am not going to die. I am going to live for people who appreciate me. I am going to live for my daughter. And more so, I'm going to live for this Jesus that I just got to know a night before because he can mend my broken hearted. Amen. I took the courage. I called my mother from my, uh, to, uh, to, to invite her to come to Singapore to take care of my daughter so that I can start my life all over again. I can go to work to cut the story short, looking for a job for a foreigner like me back 25, 20, 20, 25 years ago that unable to speak English, don't have much education, is really, really tough. I knocked on all door. I tried McDonald's, I was rejected. I tried Kentucky Fried Chicken, I got rejected also. Okay, You want to know what was my first job in Singapore 25 years ago? I was a security guard in F&N Coca-Cola. Do I look like security guard? <laughs> Maybe back then I really looked like one, okay? Because uh, I, uh, I mean, as they look at my CV, what I am best is my Bahasa Indonesia. 
So they say, okay, you know, uh, you can uh, speak to your uh, colleague. Uh, yeah. So I was very poor. My uh, uh, salary is $2.70 per hour after the deduction from the agent. I cannot make ends meet. How poor I am. I can only eat one meal a day. Okay, if I buy a packet of rice, oh, yeah, I have to uh, split it. Half for lunch, another half for dinner. If I buy a packet of uh, a, a bread, a loaf of bread, I have to cut. I will eat the skin so that my daughter get to eat the white part. That was how poor I was. But our God is a promise-keeping God. He gave me a verse in Joel 2, 25 and 26. Joel 2, 25 and 26, the Bible says, I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten of you. You will eat in plenty and praise the name of the Lord your God who has done wondrous work in you. And this is what he said, For my people will never be put to shame. Romans 10, 11. Those who believe, believe means adheres to, relies on, and trust in. Those who believe will never be put to shame. Those who believe will never be disappointed. I hold on to this, the word, the word of God, because I know people will fail us. Men will fail us. But Jesus and his true living God never fail us. Amen. To cut the story short, my supervisor looked at me. What are you doing here? You know, uh, you're still very young. Can I send you to English course? After that, you come back, you can become receptionist. One or not? One or not? One, okay. So I went for English course. I came back, I became receptionist, okay? <laughs> And then uh, the, the, uh, the, my manager looked at me again. What about I send you for further course? Then you come back, you can do other things. I say, okay, send me for further course. I came back, I became administrator. Wow. Oh, okay, yeah. So uh, then the, the company looked at me again and said, what about I send you for further course? Then you come back, you can do other things. One or not? Wow. One or one. Okay, I went for further course. I came back, I become a manager. Wow. <laughs> then the company said, what about I send you for further course again? You want? You want? Okay, send me for further course again. I came back, I became a general manager. Wow. <laughs> okay. And then, the uh, company said again, what about I send you for further course again? What or not? One. I went to another course again. I came back, I became a managing director within a span of uh, 10 years. All glory to God. And uh, I, after that, I became an entrepreneur, I became a businesswoman, but I'm not a normal businesswoman. I'm a businesswoman that are passionate about the things of God. So uh, I will take uh, a, a portion of my profit uh, to feed the poor, the needy, the orphans, and the widow. Later I'll share with you. So, um, and I'm also an Odin pastor, yeah, together with my husband. So, uh, well, my... Finance is restored according to God's promise. Amen. Hallelujah. What about my daughter? Uh, the doctor say that surely he will never, she will never live past three months. She live past three months. The doctor say that surely she will never live past one year. She live past one year. And then uh, the doctor say that at the age of uh, two, she need to go for surgery. Okay, and ask me to prepare one hundred thousand. At that point of time, I don't have 100,000 sing dollar, but I have a big God. And one of his name is Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that can hear. So I prayed and I prayed and I prayed. I stopped seeing doctor. I'm not saying that if you're sick, you don't see doctor, okay? Because uh, God can choose to heal through doctor. But given my situation and my circumstances, I cannot afford to see doctor. That's why I stopped. Okay, so um, my daughter, through prayer and prayer and prayer, she got better and better and better. And at the age of six, God said, why not you bring her back to the same cardiologist and do a check and see what happened. 
I brought her back to the same cardiologist and they do the ECG and they printed out the report. They put the two reports side by side, the old report and the new report. He said that you look, this is the old report. The heart is failing. There's three holes. He said, you look at this new report. This is totally a perfect heart. And the doctor keeps saying, this is impossible. Why? Because from the medical point of view, from withhold to, be, to become without hold, they can trace back the recovery process. But in your daughter case, the doctor said that they cannot trace back. Okay? And when they put the two reports side by side, these two is not connected to each other. As if there is a hand that removes the bad one and put in the new heart. So this is totally a complete, perfect heart. Who can perform such a miracle if not the Lord our God, Jehovah Rapha? Amen. So uh, my daughter is healed from the heart condition and my daughter today is uh, 26 years old. And then uh, when my daughter was uh, seven years old, I also uh, got married uh, again in a church uh, with uh, Pastor Jason Ong. Uh, he is now sharing in uh, speaking in Living Sanctuary uh, Braden Church. Yeah, that's why he cannot be here uh, with us. Okay, so um, friends, when miracle happen, what do you say? Praise the Lord, Hallelujah! Right? From a security guard to be. To, you know, to managing director, to entrepreneur, to businesswoman, what do you say? Praise the Lord! And then when your baby is uh, sick and uh, nearly died, uh, you know, with three holes in her heart and miraculously healed, what do you say? Praise the Lord! And then my life was restored exactly according to the promise of God in Joel 2, 25, 26. And what do you say? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. My question is this. What if things are not happening according to what you wish? What if your loved one is stricken with cancer? What if you have to face bankruptcy? What if you lose your job? What if you lose a loved one? Can you still say, praise the Lord? Can you still say, hallelujah? Two years after I got married, my husband always giddy and uh, vomiting. We went to uh, see a doctor. The doctor say, your husband got a brain cancer. And his condition is the first case founded in the whole of Singapore. It's called endolymphatic sac tumor. In the whole of US, there are not more than 50 cases founded. In the whole world, there are not more than 200 cases Founded. And because it is so little number of people getting this kind of uh, cancer, there's no drugs, there's no therapy, nothing that they can do. In Singapore, two surgeons, two professors came together, one from uh, NNI, one from ENT, and they do not know what to do. They have to invite two professors from John Hopkins. Four professors came to Singapore and they study the case. And this case became very famous. It was posted on the medical journal. And the title goes like this. Number one case founded in Singapore. Endolymphatic sac tumor. Patient named Jason Ong. And my husband became famous because of that. We already serving God at that point of time. And... We ask, God, why is this happening to us? You want to know what God say? Do you want to know or not? Yes. He gave us Romans 8.28. He said, all things will work together for good. For those who love God. And for those who have been called according to His purpose. I was like, good? 
what good can come out of such a severe cancer? The doctor said, there's no drugs for you, there's no treatment for you, there's no radiotherapy, there's no chemotherapy. The only thing that we can try is surgery. He went for surgery. The first surgery took 20 hours. If you touch at the back of your ears, it's hard, right? There's bone, right? Before they, need to, um, before they perform the surgery, they have to re uh, cut off the, the bone. They have to saw away the bone. And then they went in. After 20 hours of surgery, the doctor told me this. I'm sorry, we are too late. I said, what do you mean that we are too late? He said that the cancer is so aggressive, it has destroyed the balanced nerve, it has destroyed the hearing drum, it has destroyed the hearing nerve. So everything that is within here that has been destroyed, they have already removed. And the cancer is so aggressive, it has spread and 30% has already stuck on the main artery. The main artery, they cannot do anything because if they are not careful, they touch. When the main artery bursts, he will become, uh, a fat, you know, that he, he, he will not be able to make it. So the doctor said this to me. You only have six months. Your husband only has six months to live. And how he's going to die, this is how he's going to die. The cancer will continue to bite the main artery. And the main artery will burst. And he will suddenly collapse from the eyes, from the nose, from the mouth, and from the ears will come out blood. This was our reality, friends. Can I have the keyboards? To, yeah. This was our reality. My husband was still in ICU at that point of time. And I told him, Husband, husband, doctors say that you are going to die within six months. The doctor say, go and settle your affair because, uh, yeah, six months, maximum. I asked my husband, how? Doctors say you're going to die in six months. You want to know what is my husband's answer? Do you want to know or not? This is what he, he said to me. He said, I don't care what the doctor say. As long as I breathe, as long as I live, I'm going to make every day count for Jesus. If I ever get out from this hospital still able to function, don't waste your time anymore. Let us go all out to serve God even more. Let us go all out to save the poor, the needy, the orphans and the widow in a third world country because I don't have any more time to waste. I said, okay. True enough, he can get out. He can still function as per normal except he cannot hear anymore and he cannot walk straight and there are many things that he cannot do so we go all out. Maybe I can uh, show you, uh, can, 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 can show a slide. Uh, yeah. We go to Pakistan. We go to Myanmar. We go to Cambodia. We go to Philippines. We go to Indonesia, Malaysia, China. And we started our ministry with 30 children. And the ministry grew from 30 children to 300 children. From 300 children, it grew to 600 children. And six months later, he did not die. But the cancer also grew. The ministry grew, the cancer also continued to grow. He said, come on, let's go even more. I don't have time to waste anymore. We need to be more aggressive. Just one more for Jesus. Just one more. So the ministry grew again. From 600 children, it grew to 900 children. From 900 children, it grew to 1,200 children. And he never died. But the cancer also continued to grow. From 30%, it grew to a size of a golf ball. From a size of golf ball, it grew to a size of an egg inside the head. You know, friend, cancer 
is real. Cancer is very painful. We go to a place uh, where the dumping site is. Maybe you can show the, uh, those uh, pictures. In these kind of places that we go, there's no doctor. In our pocket, there's always painkiller. We started using Panadol Extra Strong. Two, four, six, eight. It doesn't work anymore. What do you do? You change to Ponstan. Two, four, six, eight. It doesn't work anymore. What do you do? You change to Acoxia. Again, it doesn't work anymore. What do you do? And friends, do you want to know how long we walk through this journey? Work very hard. 17 years in the ministry. 17 years feeding the poor, the orphans, the, the widows. We have never once had to raise funds. When God calls, He will provide. When God calls, He will protect. Amen. What do we do? We work very hard. And after that, we put down everything. We take the profit. And then we go and do this work. Ten years as if walking in the pitch black, black tunnel. There's not even a light at the end of the tunnel. And these ten years, this is what I see him doing. Never one time he's in depression. Never one time he blamed God. Never one time he said that, God, if you don't heal me, I'm not going to serve you anymore. Never. Every time when he's in pain, he will find a corner, he will kneel down, one hand he will put at where the pain is, and the other hand he will raise to God. And this is what he said, Yet I choose to praise you. Yet, at all time, in all circumstances, I will say that you are good and your mercy endures forever. You know, when you brush your teeth, you spit out his white Colgate, right? Toothpaste. For him, when he brushes his teeth and he spit out, it's red, it's blood. After that, there's blood caught. There's always a voice asking, Where is your God? You serve God? You think you're so good? You think you're so clever? Your God cannot even heal you. Look at your condition. It's deteriorating. What do you do? This is what I see my husband do. He will wipe away his blood. Blood always come out from the nose. You know, when I got up, I saw the pillowcase, there's always blood. I don't know where the blood come from. He will wipe away the blood. This is what he say. For me, to live is Christ. To die is gain. Oh, death, where is your sting? I am still standing because my God, one of His names is Emmanuel. And His promise is He will never leave me, He will never forsake me. That is where my God is. And amazingly, the pain will just go away. So we continue. We continue the work. From 1,200 children, the ministry grew to 1,500 children. And the cancer also continued to grow from a size of one egg, this time round, to a size of two eggs. One inside the brain, one outside the brain. 2012, December, was his birthday. I asked him, where do you want to go? 
because we thought that was his last birthday. He cannot really function already. He said he want to go to the uh, Philippines, up in the mountain of Santo Tomas, to see the children that we care for for the last time. True enough, when we came back, he cannot function anymore. One day, he can only got up two hours. He cannot work, he cannot do business, he cannot minister, he cannot preach anymore. And that two hours, he will gather his strength to prepare me. And he said that, don't blame God. Don't get angry with God when I die. Continue to press on until I see you again in heaven. I said, okay. Ten years, I never cried in front of him. Behind him, I cried. He always prepared me. Are you ready? I see you in heaven, okay? In front of him, I said, yes, I'm ready. I'll see you in heaven too. Yeah. But then I'll go behind and I'll cry and I'll cry and I'll cry. 2013, March, he went for another surgery. Seven hours this time round, and when he came out from the surgery, he cannot see anymore. He cannot hear already, now cannot see. And then uh, he, he was in so much pain, he cannot breathe. Friday was the surgery. He said to me, I think it's enough. Stop praying for me. I want to go home to be with my Heavenly Father. I have done enough and now it's time for me to leave. On Saturday, we said goodbye. We prepare everything. We prepare the funeral, we prepare the photo, we prepare the family. That was the very first time. After 10 years, I cracked in front of him. I take out my handphone and I said, can you record something? Say that you love me. Say that you miss me. So that these two words perhaps will carry me through when I miss you when you are no longer here. Friends, I just want to encourage you. Husband and wife. I want to speak to husband and wife. Do you want to know what I learned fighting cancer for 10 years together with my husband? This is what I learned. There's not even enough time to love. Why do we have to fight all the time? Stop fighting. Do you know the only time and place where you can still be husband and wife is right here on earth. In heaven, we are no longer husband and wife. Learn to treasure each other. That was what happened to me. In the hospital, I realized how short is the time. Even to love is not enough. That was Saturday. Everything was prepared. And then, but I guess God is not yet done with us. Saturday night at the hospital. Uh, you can show the uh, uh, picture on the hospital. Yeah, you the same. I was waiting for him at a corner. Surgery is on a Friday. Saturday night, 12 o'clock midnight. He opened his eyes and he cried. My husband, some of you, have, you, have, you have met him. You know, he's a macho guy, he don't cry. 20 hours surgery, he never cried. Fighting cancer 10 years, he never cried. But that moment, he cried. His whole body was trembling. The bed was shaking. And tears rolling out of the eyes. And he cried really loud. Ah, Jesus is here, Jesus is here. I open my eyes and I look at him and I notice that you know surely something is unusual. Okay. So I got up, I'm trying to reach him at the bed. Just a few steps before I can even reach the bed, I fell down under the glory of God. I fell down 
under the weight of His glory in His presence. Do you know, friends, what I wanted at that point of time is for my husband to be healed, right? It's for Jesus to heal him, right? But yet, in that presence, I cannot utter a word of request. The only thing that can come up from these lips is this. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Who am I? Who are we all? The God of heaven and the earth. The King of all kings. The Lord of all lords. The creator of heaven and earth and all that is within it would love us so much to send His one and only begotten Son into this world, the world that betrayed Him, the world that is in sin, the world that hated Him so much and died for us on the cross. And as long as we believe in Him, we will be with Him in paradise. Belief means adheres to, relies on, and trust in. Belief means trusting Him and obeying Him. Who am I? I can only say thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And this is what I see Him doing. He took a deep breath and He fell asleep. That was Saturday night. Sunday, 8 o'clock in the morning, the nurse came to me and wake me up. Hello, hello? Wake up, wake up, wake up. I woke up. Where's your husband? Your husband is not on the bed. Your husband is gone. Where is he? I got panicked. The nurse got panicked. I feel so ashamed I can take care of a patient until the patient is gone. I also don't know. The nurse got panicked, press emergency button. Ring, patient missing, patient miss, miss, missing. You need to know, Friday is the surgery. This is bed seven surgery, major surgery. This is Sunday, okay, the third day. Yeah. And then he's gone. And then we were like panicking and my husband opened the toilet door. He opened the toilet door. Why so noisy? Are you looking for me? I'm not missing. I'm here. We were like, how can you? You go to shower, you know, we can smell the soap bath, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you go to shower, he said, yeah, he said that, uh, you know what? Jesus came last night and he touched me right here and he breathed a new breath of God into my nostril. I fell asleep. And this morning, I wake up, I can see. Yesterday, I cannot see, right? I can see. I saw you, you were sitting there, you're tired. I don't want to disturb you. I let you sleep. And the pain is gone. Just like that. Just like that. Because the pain is gone, I try. I get out of the bed. I see whether if I can stand. Eh, I can stand. I take a few steps. Eh, I can walk. So, I remove all my string and needle, law. If you see my husband, you know, he can remove, the, you know, he's that, that type that he can remove his own, you know. Yeah. Then it's very hot. It's very hot. So I go shower lah. The nurse was like, Jesus came. You go back to your bed. You are a naughty patient. I'm going to call your doctor. He called the doctor. The doctor, he is a professor from NNI, number two in Singapore, also a Christian. Okay, the doctor is a bit stressed with our situation, uh, with, 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 with his condition. Prior, and the doctor is a very humble uh, a man. Prior to the surgery, he tell me that go and tell all your friends, all your pastor friends to pray. Okay, that the hand of God will guide my hand as I do the surgery because I don't have record killing pastor. So he must come out alive. Okay, <laughs> yeah. So he look and he check and he check and he check. He said that serious, ah, he, you are okay. Ah. He said that yeah, I'm okay. He said that, you know, 
one year, I do 50 over cases, brain surgery. I have never seen recovery like this. Surely, this come from the Lord, our God, Jesus Christ. Amen. You know what? Monday, before 12 o'clock, the three of us walk out from the hospital. And today, he's healed. All glory to God. Can I have the worship team to prepare for uh, the song, yeah, the heart of worship? Friends, this is my story. This is my daughter's story. This is my husband's story. You know what? If not because of Jesus Christ, the three of us won't be around today. My question is this. What about your story? What about your struggle? What about the breakthrough that you are looking for? Friends, I am not here to sell you Jesus. I'm not here to even promote and to say that you must accept Jesus Christ because He is just too glorious. He is just too awesome. He is real. But what I'm trying to tell you is this. If Jesus can be so real in my life, if this Jesus can be so real in my daughter's life, if this Jesus can be so real in my husband's life, he can be real too in your life. What you need to do is just believe. Because the Bible says, those who believe will see the glory of God. Amen. Amen.